Welcome to the Sunday message from Hollyview Church in Boring, Oregon. We gather each Sunday morning at 1030 as a worshiping community of Jesus followers on mission to see God glorified in our lives, our cities, and around the world. At Hollyview, the Bible serves as our foundation and guide for both life and ministry. It tells the story of God and the story of us. We believe the better we know the themes and flow of the biblical story, the better we will be able to find our little place in God's grand storyline. Thank you for joining us. And now here's this week's message from Hollyview Church with special guest speaker Jeff Hart of Hispanics for Christ as he preaches from Genesis chapter 10 with a message entitled Table of Nations. Actually, Joel, I think my church was glad to get rid of me this week, so it may not be quite so. And, and you know, I listened to Rich Mullins on the way over here. I was just geeking out on it, and it was so great. To, I thought we were going to have an all Rich Mullins worship service here with the first two songs. I was hoping we'd keep going on that, but, but the first two were great. And if you think about that, that first song, Creed, we have been singing that for 1,700 years, give or take, or repeating it or reciting it or some form of that, that has been what has gathered us and kept us together, the core teaching of what we believe for, for so long across so many countries and so many different people. That is just exciting and amazing to think that we've said those same words, maybe in Latin, maybe in other languages, but the same idea. And Rich Mullins finally put him to some good music and that we could sing them, because I don't remember anything unless it's lyrics to a song. So better that than the stuff from the 70s I listened to. So we are going to be in Genesis 10, and then I'll finish up talking a little bit about Hispanics for Christ. But this is a really exciting piece. So you can start us out there on the first slide there. Let's see what we end up with. OK. Um, what does Noah have to do with missions? He, a lot, uh, a lot. They come together. And really, it was so interesting that Joel asked me to come out here today because this topic has been something that has woven its thread through everything I do these days, through my work as a pastor, through my work as a missions leader, through my work as a, a missiologist and being involved with missions as a, a professor in that. There's a thread that runs through all of these that comes right down to Genesis 10 that kind of makes the foundation for why we do these sort of things. So it's really exciting to to be here and look at this. It's a really interesting uh, passage. And it, it more than just that, for those of us who proclaim to be Christian, it kind of gives us our reason for our worldview and one sense of how we relate to other people. It really does, if, if we really believe it and have faith and accept that. So the implications that come out of this are very different for us as Christians versus the implications of somebody who believes in I love the line from Nacho Libre. Sorry, my stupid brain. You know, it's like, I believe in science. <laughs> Anybody seen that movie? It's like, okay, then that leads to a whole lot of problems. But I believe in God's word, which leads to a whole lot of good things. And so we're, that's where we're going to go today. So let me just pray as we launch into this. Holy Spirit, help us this morning as we go into the word given to us by our Heavenly Father. As it's been written down, by those who you inspired to write. And Lord, give us that ability to believe this and to really embrace it and then to live it out, Lord. So this morning, I pray that you speak to each one of us, that you would give each one of us that, that individual word we need so that we might be stronger in our faith this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, next slide. We're going to start out uh, by reading the whole passage with every name. No, no, we're not going to do that. We, we can capture it, honestly, in the first and the last uh, verses in this, really capture the gist of it, and then we'll kind of talk about it, which is really the fun part about this passage anyway. Um, I don't know if it connects to what you've been learning previous to this. I hope it does. I'm assuming Joel was teaching out of the Bible, so it should be good. <laughs> that, that It should make a connection somehow. We'll see. But in, in verse 1, it says, These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. And then it ends up in verse 32 saying, these are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So I spared you from that whole long list, but we have to remember that the primary purpose of <clears throat> this, this list and this passage in the Bible is, is not it's to show us what God's been doing. It's to give us the story of God throughout history so we would know where and how we fit into this big story 
that's been going on for 5,000 years. It's not a history book per se. It's not a science textbook per se. It's not a rule book per se. It does have science. It does have history. It does have rules. But that's not the main thing. It was written to show us and tell us what God's been doing. So in, that, in this story here in Genesis 10, we get a lot of that. And you notice some of the words that are in this in here, the words like, like generations and sons and born, and clans, nations. The, and the key is, from these, the nations spread on the earth. That's the key. From these, the nations spread on the earth. And this explains the origins of all humanity. All humanity. It's, as we look at this in here, it doesn't matter what our nationality is, what our ethnic heritage is, however you want to label it, our race is, you know, what breed we are, it doesn't matter. We all come from this one source. And that's the amazing thing about this. And so I love this. I, so we're going to spend some time. I don't know how it might come out good enough. I'll, I'll point out things. And I go to the next slide there. This, this is a um, chart of the, well, it's called the table of the nations in one sense, but the descendants of Noah. And it's a lot of fun what's in this chart. There's a lot of things you can really geek out on if you like the Bible and you like to study that are in this chart. And has anybody done their own genealogy with Ancestry.com? Has somebody done that in here? A few of you have. So it's kind of fun once you start tracing things and putting them in charts and figuring out who you're related to. Well, I got some news for you. Ancestry.com hasn't hooked up all the way back to this yet, but they should. Because this is where it all goes back to in the genealogy charts, is back to here. And so I just want to point out some of the interesting things in this between the three sons <clears throat> and, um, and where they get to initially. And so, you know, as you see, you've got Japheth, Ham, and Shem, the three sons of Noah. And there's a, there's a time frame sort of to put this into that helps us a little bit in this, is that uh, Noah, from the time of Adam to Noah, and you can do the math on this. I, I didn't do math, that's why I went to seminary, because I didn't have to do any math in seminary, but I've read the math is good on this, that if you do the, the years that the Bible tells us, it's about 1,000 years from Adam to Noah. 1050, they say, or something like that. So, so from Adam to Noah is about 1,000 years. And then the, the flood hits about 2300 B.C., so 2,000 years before Christ, the flood hits. So 1,000 years up here to Adam, and then at about the 2,000 years before Christ, you've got the flood going on. And then Abraham is about 200, I'm using really round numbers, he's about 200 years after the flood. So you kind of see we're talking, we got 3,000 years before Christ, and here we are, 2022, so 2,000 years after. So we've got about a 5,000-year history of humanity. What would happen before that? I don't know. It's above my pay grade to figure out Lucy and, you know, all these Australopithecus people and stuff and all that. I, I know what the Bible says, and, and that's as most I can grasp with my head around. So in this frame, when we're looking at the time of Noah in there, we're about 2,000 years before Christ. So this all starts uh, when the ark gets shipwrecked. Go to the next slide here. And this, this part I love. Here we go, some geek stuff. Um, there's nobody is sure where exactly the ark landed. Um, there's a lot of ideas and everything. We know they, the Bible says it was in Ararat, the mountains of Ararat, which is the land between Turkey and Armenia, right there. Close enough. If we would have actually found the ark, you know what we people do. We would go set up a shrine and start worshiping it. So I don't think God is ever going to let us find the ark. I don't care how many people have pieces of wood from it and... You know, we've got the doorway to it or, you know, whatever people claim. I don't think God wants to have it. But the, it does say Ararat, and that is an actual place. That is mountains, and it's between Turkey and Armenia. <clears throat> um, the important piece is that you can see here uh, where this is all happening to begin with. So that's where humanity basically begins again, is in that spot right there between Turkey and Armenia. And we're not really too far from where all the warring is going on right now. It's to the south of that. And, and in this, one of the most fascinating things, right there on the border between Turkey and Armenia today is a place called the City of a Thousand and One Churches. It's Ani, A-N-I. If you look up online, the pictures are amazing. It's abandoned. 
It's gone today. It's in a it's in an area that is um, disputed between Turkey and Armenia, so it's a war zone basically. Nobody gets to go in there. But in this place, right where the ark landed, right where civilization rebirthed, there was a town once about a uh, thousand A.D. that was one of the largest cities in the world, and it had fifty churches in this city. It had it had uh, thirty three cave chapels, they call them, and 20 other chapels. Almost 100 houses of worship in this little city. It was a center of Christianity for a time in that area, right where the ark landed. And But from there, it pushes out. So if you go to the next slide, um, this kind of shows us where they landed, the three brothers, where they are said to have gone down to. And in this, it shows generally where they were. <clears throat> and this probably lasts the first and second generations after Noah. If you were the chart we saw, you can follow down the generations. So Ham, he goes into what we know now as Africa. North Africa, middle of Africa, down to where we'd say today is like Ethiopia, Sudan area, and then over at the very southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. That's where his immediate descendants go to. But then you've got, on the other side of that, you've got um, Shem, who ends up in, in pretty much like the Middle East, the Arabic countries of today. So that's where he and probably his children would have gone to. It doesn't take very long before they start leaving the parameters of where they, they start out at, and they start crossing over and going everywhere. But initially, they end up there. And then Japheth, he would expand to the east and north of, <clears throat> of where the Ark landed. So where Turkey, Armenia border, he starts going north. <clears throat> Sorry, I picked up a cough today. I don't know why. And, and to the west. And that would be Europe, southern Europe and central Europe. That would be where his descendants would have landed. And after a couple generations, there's just mix, mixing going on. So you see names in those charts that show up in other places. You say, well, I thought he was supposed to go here. Canaan, for example. Why, he's supposed to be in, in uh, the land of Ham in Africa. But he's showing up over in the Arabic lands in the Middle East. But that's because people moved around. They used the names. It gets lost after time. Uh, next chart. And in that chart, there's a, there's a whole bunch of interesting bits of, well, it's not trivia in a sense. It might be. It might be something you could use in a Bible trivia game. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and, but, but they're really, they are important, and they do relate to what we're trying to figure out here. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so uh, next slide. In here. One of these, uh, these names over here is Peleg, and you're going to go to chapter 11 next week? Well, I'm going to probably blow some of your thunder for that. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> but chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, is out of place chronologically. It, you read it in chapter 11, it's after 10, and you say, wait, because in chapter 10, we're not going through it all, but it talks about the nations and their languages. So wait a minute. Sounds like they already had different languages. How come at the Tower of Babel, they're scrambled? Well, the Bible has this habit of doing things in ancient writing of, his, of a circula, circulation or a circulatory writing. They'll write something and tell you the story, and then they'll move forward, and then they'll come back to it again. This is one of those incidents of that. Because the Tower of Babel most likely happened with Peleg which would be one, two, three, four, five generations after Noah. Fifth generation after him is probably when this happened. That's because in chapter 10, our, our chapter, it says, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. <clears throat> so it looks like, best we can tell, it was in that generation that Babel happened, the Tower of Babel. And so... We take a guess that maybe it was there, fifth generation down, that we see this happening. Now, you've got to remember, too, when we talk about these generations, it's not like our generations. The average life expectancy in the United States right now, I think, is 76 years. So some of you folks are on wonderful extra time. You're an extra. <laughs> I'm hoping to make it to extra minutes in the game. But, but when you read these guys' lives, I don't know that I'd want them. They are hundreds and hundreds of years. So when you say second generation, that's not 70 years later. That might be two, three, 400 years later. That's a long time between generations. We were talking this morning a little bit. When you have that much time, you can really create some big families. 
You got lots of time for babies and grandchildren and great grandchildren and great 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 grandchildren all around you. So it kind of explains how the population of the world can expand so quickly. You have a lot more time to multiply. So in it, we think Peleg is probably where it uh, split and, and languages broke up amongst the different people and were scattered. <clears throat> Go to the next slide there. And the names of the cities and people show up here. And, and this is where we can see a lot of history in this and, and makes us wonder a little bit. Like <clears throat> in the middle, Ham's son, Canaan, he should have been in Africa, but Canaan becomes prominent in the Middle East. When we read our stories, I, I just went through Joshua and just taught Joshua at my church. It's all about the Canaanites. And you can see all their tribes in that line. Jebusites, Amorites, Gergesites, Hivites, uh, Hamathites. All those people end up over in the Middle East. They're in the promised land. So, but we know where they came from. So wait, let's think about that a little, little bit. So as Joshua and the Israelites are now conquering the promised land, who are those people that they're fighting against? Relatives. Those are cousins. Those are all cousins. They're directly related to them. Even though the Israelites most likely came out of the line of Shem. As we go down to Abraham and that. So they would have descended all the way down to Abraham. So they would have come out of that line. But they're their cousins that they're fighting against. That gives you an immediately a different perspective of who they are. These are not crazy, pagan, different from me people that I have no connection to at all. These are my cousins. We have the same family line. We are related to each other. And yet you read scripture, and the way they viewed them was as if they were from another planet. There's no expression that, that these are our, our cousins, I would say. can't say brothers and sisters. They're not quite that close, but they're definitely cousins. So there is a connection between those. And Japheth's sons seem to have stayed up in the north. And we do see in scripture later on more about them in the north because there's references in uh, Ezekiel 27 that Israel's trading partners were Tubal and Meshach, <clears throat> sons of Japheth. They evidently appear to stay up in the north. It's the people of Israel. And there was, a, there was business going on between those two. They seem to have a little bit better relationship. That's until you get to the end times. Because <clears throat> when we get to the end times, Magog appears in Revelation. Now, I'm not an expert on the end times. I'm, the only thing I'm absolutely 100% clear and sure about is Jesus is coming back. When, how, what day, what he's going to, you know, that stuff is up for debate. But in the end times, when you read Revelation, there is a reference there to this group of people, Magog, that is part of the alliance that attacks Jerusalem and God's people. So they exist today. This is my mind wandering off a bit. They exist today. I wonder who they are. Because we don't really know. I know a lot of the people, Hal Lindsey and people who like to write end time books and sell lots of stuff like that. They, they might call them the Russians or they like to put a label on them. But honestly, we don't know. There's somebody from Northern Europe. But the names have changed with the people groups. But there's somebody up there. So in the end times, it could be the Russians and the Chinese that are in this affiliation that's coming against God's people. Whoever they are, whatever group it is, they are descendants of Magog. But more than that, they're related to those very people that they're going to be attacking at the end times in Scripture. <clears throat> so I think that's one of the important things is seeing that there is a definite connection between all these. Something else in there, go ahead and go to the next slide there. Um, another name that shows up in there is in Japheth's line, which was the European line. In there, there's one descendant called Ashkenaz. Even to today, Jews that come out of Europe are known as Ashkenazi Jews. That still word is with that word is still with us today in, in that. So when there, there's a large number that when the, the Jews were um, uh, taken into captivity and split up and, and spread out into the world. Those that went up into Europe, they established whole communities, large communities up there. And today, when they come back, they're referred to as Ashkenazi Jews versus the Jews that come from the Middle East. 
But their name that they get comes from the people that descend from Japheth in Europe. So that's still with us today. Out of this genealogy chart from Genesis 10, we still are connected to it, which, which just to me seems like really a fascinating thing that we still see it connected in there. And the bottom line in all this is that we are all connected. We all descend from one of those three lines. There is no choice of somewhere else, whether you're white, black, African, American, um, Chinese, anywhere on this planet, we descend from one of these three lines. We have common DNA to everybody. There's no exceptions to it. You believe the Bible, there is no exceptions to it. But there's one more line that comes out of this that we connect back through. Next slide. <clears throat> and that's Jesus. Luke chapter 3, Luke records the genealogy of Jesus backwards to connect him to Abraham. And here you have Abraham connecting back to Shem. So we can see that we too are related to Jesus by our family line, our genealogy. So it's amazing. You know, we get excited over discovering a third cousin twice removed in another state somewhere, and oh, wow, it's a relative that you've never met, you have no idea, but we get excited about it. But you know what? When you talk about your brothers and sisters in Ukraine, those are literally brothers and sisters. They are literally part of your family line and my family line. It's, it's worldview changing to understand we are actually connected to everybody else on this planet. They're really not strangers in that sense. And that, that's a whole different way of looking at that. So next slide. What does this have to do? Uh, I want to come back to my comments at the beginning of this, is that this touches on so many areas of my own ministry and life these days that it's why I enjoyed reading it and studying it and thinking about it, is, is that it does make these really great connections. So here's two things. Next slide is... Um, all the ministry, my ministry rests on the message of Genesis 10. It really does. And that the implications of Genesis 10 are very different than what evolutionary theory gives us. Sorry, all you science people in the room. It's, uh, this is just the reality to it. If, if we're Christians that believe the Bible. Uh, so let me walk through some of this. Next one. It, when it comes to pastoral work, in this area, the focus to me of pastoral ministry is reconciliation. It's reconciling people to God and people to each other. And, and we've missed this sometimes. We can see that so many other things get in the way of that work that we have. But as a pastor, it's really about this ministry of reconciliation. To understand that even within our church, when we have relationships that are broken in the church, it's like, this isn't just your wife you're having a fight with. She's actually your family. She's closer than that. You need to reconcile here. This isn't just a neighbor you're upset with. This isn't just your brother that you can't stand and don't talk to. We've got to reconcile this because we are family. And it, it's heightened my feeling personally of responsibility as a pastor is to really work towards reconciling vertically and horizontally people to do that within all every opportunity I get is to see that happen. And it's beautiful when it does because you know family has come back together. But in missions work, it's the same thing with missions work. It's to understand that the work that we do out there is following up on God's initiative, on his plan to reconcile the world to himself, to reconcile the people of the world to themselves. He says it all through the Old Testament, Isaiah 49, you know, that Jesus would be a light to the nations. I mean, Israel was supposed to be <clears throat> that shining example that, sh that shone out to the world and drew them to God back into that one family that they were created. That's the core of our missions work. So now we go everywhere. We have this calling to go to other countries, to other places, to other neighborhoods to help reconcile them to God. That's a big burden for us. It's a big responsibility that we should take seriously is reconciling people to God. That, that's a core of missions work. And that kind of ties into my last one, missiology there, is I'm involved with the Evangelical Missiological Society, and um, it's a bunch of missions professors and uh, missions uh, organizers and people who are involved in it where we study and write and, and uh, look at this. This year, it's, it's almost a 
I would say aha, but it's more of a duh moment, that we, we, the theme for this year's research and everything has been um, reconciliation, God's mission through missions for all. I don't know how we missed it all these years, but I realize now that my missions work, reconciliation was never really a, a part of it. It never was really a topic that we studied. But this year, we're given it intentional study. And it's really exciting to see all the different ways people are thinking about this, researching it, especially in the field of missions. <clears throat> it's, it's not been a role of the missionary per se. Evangelism is the role of the missionary. Planting churches is the role of the missionary. Reconciliation hasn't really been on the table, and it should be. And so we're, it's, it's exciting to see what's going to come out of this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to, I don't know, I, I think it's fortunate. My, my wife may not because it's going to take a lot of time. But I'll be one of the editors for this year's book that comes out of this. So that means we collect 150 research papers, and we weed through those to come down with the 10 to 15 best that will be included in this book. But it's all about this field of reconciling in a cross-cultural field. And that's really what missions come down to, is understanding we have a calling to others, but they're not really others. They're just distant family members. And that's a, a different way of looking at it. It can be summarized in the word reconciliation. Next slide. Um, it can be, it really it comes down to that to cover everything. So uh, I want to make sure I get through so I have some time for some Hispanics for Christ stuff. But next one we'll go into, hit the next slide there, is on the implications for um, this idea of evolutionary theory. It's, it's, it's really touches on that, too, and how we understand these things. Go to the next slide, then. It, um, when you think about it, the scientific model of how we come about, it's very cold, it's very clinical, it's very scientific in the sense that, that this stuff just happens randomly, and, and we really don't make the connection between the different people groups in the world. And, and when you have that, that distance between everybody that science gives us, you don't see much of a heart or reason to care about them. It's really easy in a evolutionary understanding of humanity to not have a burden for, for anybody else other than yourself. It's get what you can now because to only the strongest, to the winners go the spoils kind of an attitude that comes out of that. And that is so contrary and different than to a Christian understanding of things. And so next slide there. If we think about a Christian way of looking at these things, uh, let's say a, a revelation from biblical revelation in there, is that <clears throat> we have a relational connection with everybody versus a scientific way saying we're not really connected relationally to anybody. We do have one. We're in the same family. We're the same family in that. And we were all lovingly and uniquely created by God. Not random acts in science or evolutionary processes. We, we were created by this loving God uniquely. So he's made us, even today, as it ends up that we look so different, we have different languages. We, some are black, some are white, some are brown. We all look different. But we were each one created by the same God and the same love that created all these people. This is a foundation for missions work. We can't look at anybody as other or less or different because the same God created them that created me. And, and he created us to be in one family. We started out at one family back on the chart. We will be back together in one family in the kingdom of God. And... There's a responsibility for us to be involved with this, to see that everybody possible can be in that kingdom together as one family in the beautiful diversity that we see out there. Because God made it that way. He created it that way. And so Genesis 10 may, may seem like it's just a list of names, but it's really not. Because missions work, next slide, missions work gives us that opportunity to unite together, to be be involved with the work God has been doing for, well, if we were to say 2,000, 4,000 years ago when Noah's Ark landed on Mount Ararat and it began again, God has been working on it since then to bring us together into one family. It's been 4,000 years of this process, and until Christ returns, that's what we're called to do, is to be about 
our Father's business of creating one new kingdom of people. And it's exciting. When you really understand that and, and think it through, it really is exciting to be part of that. That when we go to work in Latin America and I work with Hispanics there, I, I'm, I'm being part of bringing that diversity to this kingdom that I get to spend eternity in. And those are not just people I know. They're brothers and sisters that I get to be with. Or when I'm teaching in Africa, in Liberia, where I get to go in the seminary and teach there, when I'm over there, these are not just Africans. I'm not someone better than them who's come there. I'm someone who gets to work with these guys that I'm going to get to spend eternity with. And it's going to be crazy because some of those people I work with in Africa are very different. And it's going to be, I mean, the kingdom of God is going to be fun because it's not going to all look like you. And we're going to love it. So we're going to have this, this beauty of this diversity there. And we get, we're called to be part of that. And I think this is the reason behind it all that's so important for missions work and why we should be involved in this stuff. And even young people today thinking about being involved in this, it's like you get to, to go work with other people that you're going to spend eternity with. And, and the more different, the better. It's actually fun to work with people that are different from you and learning about how to cross cultures and work with them. And to me, I mean, if it really gets you, I, my doctorate's in intercultural studies, so obviously I really liked it and got to read a lot of crazy books about it. But it's, it's great to work that way, and we're supposed to. This is normal. That's the normal, is working cross-culturally. So Genesis 10 takes us, gives us this foundation of, of where to work. Let me go to the next slide, and I'll take the last few minutes here of, of kind of telling you a little bit about Hispanics for Christ, uh, the missions organization I get to lead, what it looks like a little bit, because... Uh, you see its name, you say, well, what do you really do? And uh, do you have a big building somewhere? Or, you know, you'd like uh, uh, Luis Palau Evangelistic Association or Samaritan's Purse that have, you know, huge organizations. No, we're really small. Um, you're looking at most of it right here. It's uh, the office part of it, but not the work part of it. Next slide. So I'll start out with who we are. We have right now, we have uh, currently six field coordinators. These are like missionaries that they're all nationals. They're all from Mexico, Argentina, Paraguay. Uh, they live in their countries there. They work there. They're the guys that do the real work on the ground for us. <clears throat> and underneath them are nine more church planters that we work directly with. And then under them are probably a couple dozen more pastors that are in churches in, in small communities and um, neighborhoods and, and cities and stuff. So we're this, this network that at the... I'm not really at the top. The, the field coordinators are the guys who really, really do the work. They're the ones who decide what field they go into next, uh, where the next church plant is. They're in charge. I just get to resource them. I just get a blessing to help them do what God's called them to do. So that's, that's kind of who we are. Um, all these guys that we work with are apostolically gifted. So if you think of Ephesians, uh, how it talks about those, those five-fold gifts of the church that God gives the church to go out and do things, these guys are planters. They're, they just can't help but plant, multiply, train, raise up. Nobody stays in one church very long because they, they just they'd go nuts if you had to put them in a church. Um, I think that's one of my stronger gifts. Uh, probably why I have four different jobs and love it is because I have ministry ADD, and I, I like to do different things and move around and always thinking of the next thing to do. And God can use that. Uh, teachers hate it, but God can use it. So... These guys are like that. They're always moving around doing stuff, and they're great guys to work with. Next slide. <clears throat> so where we are, here's some of the places that we're currently working in. We've, we've been in some areas and moved out and in and out in some areas, but these are the ones that have been consistent for us. North America, we planted a church up in Canada, so we work up in Alberta, um, in Calgary there. Antonio Lopez is up there, and, and he's had a, a church he started. Um, Antonio, we couldn't get him a visa in the United States as a refugee visa, which we needed to. He was, um, came out of Mexico. He was a soldier, and he was the guy who designed the assaults on the cartels. And so there was a hit and a price put on his head. So, but the United States didn't think that was a good enough reason to be a refugee. So we got him into Canada, <laughs> and Canada took him, got him a refugee visa. Now he's, he's got landed immigrant status up there in Canada. He planted a church in, in Calgary, about a 90 people in that baptizing people all the time up there. It's a, it's a really dynamic group. Um, Washington, we've got one in Tacoma we started there. Um, Oregon, we've got a couple. We've got one at my church. Um, we've got one in Salem with Soren Krebchag. 
he's Romanian, but he's Hispanic at heart. He, he spent a lot of time working in Peru and Chile and Argentina, so he's fluent in Spanish, and he looks Hispanic, so he looks, it's, it's because he's gypsy, so he looks Mexican, so he fits right in. Everybody just thinks he's Mexican, and he's got a really successful ministry in, in Salem. Um, we're trying to get something new started in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, so we're working in this area with NAB churches. Those are all within NAB churches. Uh, next slide. We are in Mexico, and in Mexico, we, we're, we've been for uh, a good 10, 11 years, 12 years now, and <clears throat> we are in uh, Baja, California. We've got a church plant there in Rosarito. Uh, Jalisco, Caretro, Michoacan, Campeche, all those places we've got church works going, and, and one guy oversees all of it. We have our field coordinator there in Caretro. He's, he's getting, he gets to help coordinate all those guys, but it's a loose coordination. He just, he more encourages, trains, and sends them out, and they're planting churches uh, all through those different areas. Um, next uh, slide, we are in Argentina. Argentina is probably our biggest area, and Eduardo Boldain is our field coordinator there, and he's been doing this for uh, getting close to 30 years now. He's absolutely like the Apostle Paul. This guy is just like he jumped off the pages of Acts. And he has, he's got a network of about 20 churches that are his, that he oversees directly that he started up and planted every single one of them. But he also has been involved with probably two or 300 other churches across Argentina and Chile and, and Peru. So he's had this prolific ministry of church planting. <clears throat> Eduardo Buldain, our field coordinator there, he's probably the guy that's responsible for the most number of our guys. Because most of these guys have worked under him at some point or another. Paco in Mexico worked under um, Eduardo. Uh, the guy in Paraguay, next slide, we'll go to Paraguay. In Paraguay, um, Alcides worked under Eduardo and trained with him and learned. So he, he's worked with all these guys. And there's about 20 churches at least in Paraguay. They're urban, rural churches there. It's kind of a, a good network there. Um, they are all Baptistic in their practice and their doctrine and stuff, but they're not, <clears throat> they don't go by a Baptist name. They asked me at NAB a couple weeks ago, well, actually it was our new director, Harry was asking, uh, I think Harry was here, wasn't he? He didn't come visit you guys? He was asking, well, do you think these guys want to become a, a part of NAB and region of NAB? And I said, no. <laughs> they don't need it. W why? They don't need it. They're, they're, it works very good right now with this network, this loose network among all of them. They're all the same doctrinally, so there's no disagreements with that. They function well. Let's just keep a good relationship going. It's hard for an American, to, you know, we want to change everything, but that's relational there, not, you know, institutional or uh, some kind of corporate model or something like that. So the, across Paraguay, they're um, Hermanos Libre, they're Free Brethren churches in Mexico and Argentina, they're Bible missionary churches, they call it, and they all get along really well. So why mess up something that's going well? And, and one of the guys in Paraguay, the neat ministry is there. It's not just city, but one of their, uh, our second layer, he works underneath um, Alcides, our field coordinator. He has a ministry to train rural pastors. So he goes out and takes training to these guys who live in villages and in small towns back in the jungle. He takes his training out to them. And I was down there few years before COVID to see one of their graduation things. It was really exciting to see all these guys that had graduated the training program and were celebrating that in a jungle uh, village church. So it's really neat what he does too. So it's all different levels of work from urban to, to uh, uh, suburban to rural. Next slide. <coughs> so here, here's kind of an overview of the exact things we do. We do evangelism campaigns and church planting. We've sent teams down there. The table... When we were the table, now we're Stafford Christian. We planted a church in Caretro down there in Mexico, and we're down there for that. And we, we've done medical missions stuff too, dental clinics. Um, one of the best relationships, we were talking this morning about church to church partnership. One of the best ones is with Cross Point uh, Christian Church in Detroit, Michigan, which is an NAB church. Their relationship in Paraguay has gone on for a decade. And one of the guys in their church, it's a big, affluent urban church, is a really high up doctor one of those fancy medical clinics back there. I, I can't remember the name, but it's, he's way up there. He has numerous times gone down to set up medical clinics in Paraguay at, as evangelistic outreaches to use that clinic. And he's also got to address the Paraguayan Congress 
Um, so the church was able to provide this speaker of such a high status. So medical teams, um, eyeglasses. Jorge and I used to do eyeglass clinics in Mexico. That was, that was a lot of fun doing that. Um, we do a lot of pastoral training. This conference we're setting up here for uh, April is going to be pastoral training and encouragement for the pastors to bring them some new skills, but also just to keep putting that vision of missions, multiplication out in front of them. That's the key with the success in these networks. They constantly hear missions. They constantly hear missions. And so they, they think it all the time. Network building. Um, th this next trip, I think we, we are going to be able to strengthen the relationship between NAB and the IBM churches in Mexico. Um, so we, we just work networks everywhere because it's all relational. Training materials. Um, some of you have seen the story of God materials. Well, uh, Hispanics for Christ, we translated that to Spanish. And so Historia de Dios, we use those materials for uh, evangelism and discipleship. Um, now we've moved into more formal education as well. <clears throat> so we have students that are finishing their Masters of Divinity. I've, right now, we're, we're just building this program, but we have two um, doing the Master of Divinity. We have someone doing their Doctor of Ministry um, all in Spanish, and uh, I get to facilitate those guys working with um, Kairos University. And so it's delivering. Everybody doesn't need higher education like that, but a few people do because they can impact those underneath them. So we're able to do that. And supporting the facilitation of, of them with fundraising is what we can do as well. So next picture. Just a couple of quick pictures and stories. This is a dental clinic. How would you like to have your teeth worked on in somebody's patio in the back of their house? <clears throat> this is how it works. And there's a lot of places that don't get any dental care. So we've done numerous dental clinics down there and helped. This one would happen to be in Paraguay. And it was connected to an evangelistic campaign done by churches around that community. So it's tied together closely with outreach. Next one. This, this was in, um, in Mexico. It was in, uh, in a little village of uh, Yucatan, in the Yucatan Peninsula. The vin village was Quintana. And the guy in the center was uh, Ricardo Ayala. He's out of Chicago, an NAB pastor. But he worked with us. He was one of our original guys on Hispanics for Christ. <clears throat> this is down there. He's teaching these five guys how to do baptisms. They had a new church. The pastor that formed this new church in a village, the village of Quintana, he'd never done any baptisms before. But now he's got all these new believers in the village, but he doesn't know what to do. So we came down there, and Ricardo taught them how to do this, what it means, the meaning behind it. And then we did a big baptism service. You can just see it on the right up there. They built a concrete block pool just for this. And, and they were so excited. And so we celebrated. We did. We taught. And then we did the baptism. Now he knows what to do. He's got this really custom-built baptismal pool out there. And he can use that in the future. Next slide. <clears throat> this, is, this is in one of our newest churches in Marquez, just outside of Carretero, Mexico. And this guy was the first guy they reached in this community. It's a, it's a new development outside of Carretero. So with all these little houses, when they build a new development, they don't start at the 400,000s, like near me they do in my neighborhood. These are small houses that people can actually afford, and, but they'll build hundreds and hundreds of them, but there's no church there yet. So this guy, he's a zapatero, he's a shoemaker, and he came to Christ, and Paco, Damian, our field coordinator, he started working with this guy. Their first meetings were in his house. That's where they began this, this church, and that church now, so Paco, the next step for him was to build his own house in this new community. Paco's an architect by trade, he just moved in three weeks ago to this new house. That new church meets in his house, and there's about 20 people in that church now. And so he started it working with this guy, and they did an outreach in Michoacan. Uh, they call it Happy Feet, where they take shoes out to villages to um, where they really need them bad with indigenous villages. And <clears throat> rather than getting them donated from the United States or buying them from up here, they had him make the shoes. So they paid him to make the shoes, and then they took those shoes and delivered them into the village, which is so much better, so much better. Next slide. This, we're almost done here. I just want to give you some pictures. Of these. This is Tony Campos down in, um, in Argentina, where they have a pastor's training center. And Eduardo and his son started this. And they, get, they, they have a two to three year program for pastoral training. And there's usually about 20 guys in this. And that's where they get, somebody asked this morning, do each of these couple hundred churches have pastors, yeah, because they supply them. 
They're able to raise them up from within, train them, and then send them out, which is really, really good. So Tony's teaching down there at the uh, Centro Capacitación Pastoral, and it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. And they've done it with very, very little money from America. Most of it has come from there. Limited budgets, tight, tight economics there. But they built this really nice pastor's training center. And, it, and just before COVID broke out, they prepared and sent a couple to France from their little churches. And the last slide, this is, this is Soren down in Salem at West Hills. He's down there, and he's doing evangelism. He has basketball uh, and volleyball outreaches at the church in the gym. He'll get 60 to 90 young people coming in, and then he always shares the gospel with them. And he's built his church. has got probably 50 people in it now in, at West Hills. It's in our NAB church, but it's the Hispanic congregation within West Hills. That's how we do it in the United States, because then they don't have to pay rent, utilities, all that overhead, which they can't. If they get enough, they can start to pay their pastor. And so it's a, it's a great partnership. So he's leading worship there, and um, it's been a really neat ministry. And, and, and praise the Lord, he just got his green card last week. That has taken us, we started way before COVID. COVID put the brakes on it because, you know, people weren't working. And even in the government, they weren't working in their office. It took a long time, but we finally got it. He's got his green card. Um, for a while, it was illegal, but not because we didn't want it to be. It's because... You couldn't get passports. You couldn't do anything. But it's all done now. And we're grateful. But that's, that's a quick picture of Hispanics for Christ. I'll, I'll hang around here after if you've got some more questions about it. But we thank you for your support. This church has been one of our supporting churches. And really hope that in the future we can see more involvement in that. <clears throat> not that we're looking for you to do or give more, but like you can experience what this is all like out there. Because it will bless you to be out there and see this. And I just hope more and more of you can get a chance. To, to be at some of these places and see this kind of stuff. We can get your doctors and dentists and hygienists here out there doing some stuff, and um, it's really great, especially not to have to work with all the paperwork that we make you have to do here in the United States. Down there, it's, people are just happy. Jorge told me about the times he's pulled teeth, and he was, Jorge Osorio started the Spanish for Christ, and some of you have met him and know him. He's not a dentist. <laughs> but when, when somebody's there and says, get rid of this tooth, do something. Like, well, he would do anything. And so he grabbed some pliers and pulled teeth. And it's what you do as a missionary in the... So thank you. God bless you guys. for, for It's exciting to see what's happening here. It's so great to work with Joel and, and the church. And uh, I'm blessed to be here today. So thanks for praying for us and supporting us.